Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you for joining this learning experience brought to you by Active State. My name is Cody, and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning. Before we dive in, I have just a couple of notes to review with everyone. First of all, we are recording our session today. So if you miss any of our conversation, if you'd like to watch again at a later time, or if you'd like to share this with the rest of your team, we will be sure to send you a copy of the recording via email as soon as we finish our live session today. Now, ways for you to get involved. Your first option is to use the chat tab on the right side of your screen. And when you find that chat tab, I'd like you to let us know from where in the world you're joining from today. Now, if you have specific questions, we want you to submit those questions to that Q&A tab on the right side of the chat. Um, we do have plenty of time to answer your questions. We'll be mixing them into our conversation throughout. So please do send those in as soon as you think of them, and we'll do our best to, to answer them live. Um, we do have a poll that will pop up around slide seven, so keep an eye out for that as we'd love to hear your, your feedback there. If you jump over to the handout section, there are some resources there for you, um, including our slides, so feel free to grab those while you're here with us. And finally, we will select two of our most engaged attendees today to win a $50 Amazon gift card. So ways to be eligible are to send in your chats, send in your questions, and of course you can fill out our post webinar survey that is attached to the handouts and we'll also post the link in the chat toward the end of our session. So without further ado, our topic today is future-proofing your code base with the help of auto refactoring. I'm joined today by Nicole Schwartz, Senior Product Manager at ActiveState. Also joined today by Pablo Beck, Team Lead for Tools and Infrastructure at ActiveState. And keeping our conversation rolling is our very own Sharon Florentine, Managing Editor here at TechStrong Group. So Nicole, Pablo, thank you both so much for joining us today on TechStrong Learning. Sharon, I'll give the reins on over to you and let you roll with it from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cody. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are thrilled to be here with you today. I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, we know that prioritizing app delivery comes with a little bit of an implicit cost, right? You need to accrue some technical debt while you're while you're getting there. But um, I think we should start by addressing the issue of technical debt with some some basics. So Nicole, start us off. How big is the technical debt problem today? What it is pretty big. Uh, what we've been reading is 80% of most code bases out there are never updated. 80%. Meaning, yeah. So if you think for every, you know, project you work on that there's a, you know, majority chance that once you finish that commit, you're never going to touch it again. That's what the majority of projects out there are. And um, that's not just them looking at open source projects. This was from VentureBeat and this was you know, proprietary code and open source code. So the tech debt problem is pretty big. And even if you're not part of that 80% that just don't update the project later, a lot of people are spending, you know, 20 to 40% of their developers time just trying to maintain things in a somewhat current fashion. And we all know that, you know, that's not something that anybody enjoys and prioritizes. Yeah, absolutely unfortunately, or, you know, as we'll see, it may not always be such a bad thing. But first, when we talk about technical debt, what are the main things that cause this? Pablo, I know you have some good insight into this, so I will throw this right. right to you. So hello, everyone. Um, yes, technical debt. Um, obviously, you inherit that or start with insecure code bases. So that could be cumulative years of uh, piling up software development, the same projects, doing basic maintenance, keeping the boat afloat, uh, transfer of project, transfer of code from one group to another, from one person to another, 
uh, you always have prioritization. So you do sacrifice some of your, um, your long-term maintainable goals for shorter terms where you need to deliver some of the priorities for the business. So you, you us pesky have... product managers and our deadlines, right? Yeah. <laughs> always. Um, not enough resource people so yes you do end up cutting some uh you do have to prioritize some of the deliverables and you cannot unfortunately put in everything that's needed for the product to be uh fully uh fully uh live um and uh excels are bad are a bad plan so you get down to inventories how do you keep track uh, of your assets uh, that are software related, code related. And most of the time people use Excel, which is not the best way to deal with it. Uh, because, well, Excel, you need to maintain it, like lots of things in this world. Um, obviously there's an impact with this. You end up having, um, we all heard big names in, the, in this industry <laughs> happen over the last years where there was massive, um, tech debt that ended up or not, uh, that ended up being a massive impact on, on, the, on the product, vulnerability issues. Uh, this led to financial loss, uh, reputation loss, and um, um, obviously a loss of trust. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And I think this is a, for anyone that has watched The Simpsons or is a fan, there's a famous episode of Homer uh, doing something not very smart and kind of sacrificing some of his current present fund for, uh, and instead of thinking more of a long-term where you do something that you get your deliverables now and don't plan ahead of time. Um, that is not always uh, an intended, uh, an intended uh, desire, but it does happen when you have to cut a few corners to get your deliverables out there. Um, and go next slide. So this is actually a great time, I think, for us to ask the audience and find out where all of you are today. We talked briefly about some of the reasons for technical debt. And, you know, we've been reading a lot of interesting articles about the size and scope of the problem and why it persists. So what we want to know is why you've fallen behind or in other places that you've worked why has the technical debt problem been growing? Do you have a fear that, you know, changing something is going to introduce a breaking change? You don't have enough time or resources. It's just not a priority. Risk, opportunity cost versus new features, any or all of these. And I mean, we can actually quick... Uh... While everyone's thinking, cycle back. Uh, there is a question in Q and A about the Excel sheets, where they're saying, uh, at a minimum, Excel tracking is better than nothing, which is absolutely true. But the problem is, if you need a human to keep your tracking going, you know, what if that human gets busy, whatever? So, automation, whether you write the automation yourself, we're not saying go out and buy a product, you know, like you could write some simple automation to like go ahead and regularly check when was the last time that we made commits on our repos? When was the last time we ran, you know, an Nmap scan to find new stuff on the network? You know, just something that's a little more automatic than, you could store it in Excel, I guess, if you wanted to, but just something a little more automatic than the human going in there and typing, you know, what's hiding around the office. Yeah. Yeah. It's, at the end of the day, it's all asset tracking, uh, and that has to be have that. There has to be some some automated mechanism to actually be accurate. Otherwise, you have to update your Excel spreadsheet. And... Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point too. You know, if if Excel is not always the best option, but it's it's better than nothing. If that's the only thing you got. <laughs> It's better than not tracking at all. 
And speaking of open source stuff, there's Snipe IT, which for mm. pure asset management is open source. You can also get paid plans, but uh, my hackerspace actually used to use it for tracking our tools and things. So that is free and it is database driven. There you go. There's another option. All right. Uh, I think we have given plenty of time for the poll there. And if one of the options uh, didn't really fit you, you had something else, you know, tell us in the chat. We can we can talk about that there, too. Um, I'm definitely feeling the opportunity cost versus new features. That is something every job I've ever had, that is the, the absolute struggle that I've resonated with there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at that. All right. Thank you, folks. We really appreciate you taking the time and giving us your feedback there. So let's move on and figure out why this matters. So, Nicole, why does this matter? Is this really a huge problem that we should be putting our time and energy towards? Or maybe not so much. I mean, I'm going to vote yes for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is security of your open source and security of your code. If it's sitting there, like it's that's a security risk right there. And yeah. we all hear about, you know, things in the news constantly that this got breached and that got breached. Um, and, you know, so that's terrifying and that can be expensive. Right. But also, like we said, the 20 to 40 percent of a developer's time is working on maintaining things. And, you know, in my opinion, the, the older it is, the harder it is to maintain that thing because it's not necessarily going to work with the newer, newer tooling. And so you've got, you know, people who can't work as efficiently. And also, if you've got something really old, is there enough Fortran programmers out there? to come in and code for you, or are you going to have a harder and harder time finding people to come in and work on that end of life project or end of life language? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, so going back to the very beginning when we were talking about app delivery and how does technical debt impact that app delivery it's you know we're talking about the two things here and how to optimize one but how does technical debt drag that down if you've got a library that's less performant let's say they've figured out over time that if we tweak this it's going to be more performant or you get more options more built-in functions and features your dev team is not going to have access to that efficiency they're not going to have access to those new features. And especially in the age of cloud computing, if you're paying by CPU cycle, by memory use, by ingress, egress, if you've got that memory leak or, you know, those other inefficiencies, you will literally be paying dollars for those inefficiencies. And then if your developers can't add in that new feature or because it was added to that library later, they're either gonna have to write it themselves or find a different library that's compatible with that older code base. And probably somebody wrote it into that new project because nobody liked that old one, right? So do you really wanna be stuck with that older choice? Yeah. Well, and I think uh, this this ties back into the previous question that we were talking about with, with modern applications. There was a great article on, I believe the new stack talking about cloud native software and the technical debt issue with cloud native development. Um, these modern applications often require more frequent changes. Does that necessarily mean more technical debt as well? I don't think that it has to. Um, when you're deploying more frequently, you actually get more opportunities to tweak things and fix things. Um, yeah, when sense. I was with Rackspace, we deployed every hour on the hour. Hmm. Uh, and so we could really quickly get rid of, oh, we noticed there's an update for this, or we noticed we did that you know, incorrectly. And so you could get rid of bugs and problems and tech debt really fast if you kept it top of mind. Right. Uh, so I don't, I think if you're doing a good 
DevOps CI CD process, that frequent development can work in your favor. On the other hand, if you lifted, you shifted, and you have no plans to actually re-architect anything for the cloud, that you just kind of took the standard server thing and shoved it into the cloud, I don't think that's necessarily going to apply. Okay. All right. So are there good reasons to maintain technical debt? Is this always a bad thing that you should never have any technical debt whatsoever? Pablo, you want to weigh in on this one? Absolutely. So um, I put here some numbers just to give you a, a brief idea how much you can quantify uh, tech debt can accrue to. Um, and, and this is just numbers. Uh, I think people, it's easier to understand when you bring a dollar sign versus the, the human factor and the actual, uh, if, is your job more fun or less fun because you're dealing with double tech. But um, I can uh, run a fairly good example from my previous career where we were dealing with an electronic archive system. So you on an electronic archive system, obviously you're, you, you have regulations that you're answering to, you have uh, a cumulative amount of data. So we're talking petabytes and usually this goes into a warm based system. Um, this can uh, obviously um, let throughout the years and most systems that are actually uh, are handling this kind of information are were designed in the 90s. So let's be honest, they're not fresh. You migrating this amount of data is not something you can easily do. Um, uh, it's actually almost impossible because you, you all of these systems have a are meant to answer some regulations and are meant to be tamper proof because these are legal uh, documents. So you cannot modify this. So throughout the years, you end up having multiple ways to feed the system, manage the system and message the data within the system, the metadata. Um, so that that occurs to scripts, to going from shell scripts to Perl to Python, uh, and you have feeds coming from mainframes, from the external, from you name it. Uh, but you cannot get rid of this because it's it's your bread and butter if you're actually dealing with electronic archives. So you you have to maintain everything around your systems to be uh, up to date, functioning, and obviously you cannot lose anything. And you have to be accurate in what you do because there is a, there's a very fine very hefty financial penalty to it towards fines. There is, uh, um, what else? I think the biggest one I could think of, uh, because these are heavily regulated and most of them are SEC regulated, there's even mm. possible criminal charges. So you, you don't want to mess with this, but you have to keep everything secure and long-term. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, yes, so. Um, but um, I, I put these numbers here because I think at the end of the day, there is ways to actually manage this on a long-term vision. And if you do keep this, you, you always have to think about, well, that, that might be my future problem. It, you, you, you have to always consider this, not, not just doing it. Make a friend of your future self. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you, you, you would hate to want to be that guy. Very true. So, What's the best way to eliminate or or can you eliminate technical debt without introducing breaking changes? Nicole, I know you have some really good insight here, so hit me. All right. You <laughs> any any change you do has the potential to break something because you have that dependency and you're using that function in the community drop that function. So even you know, anytime you're jumping up a, a minor version or especially a major version, there's going to be breakage. However, if you are scheduling in time to just knock that out and you are doing it on a repeated basis, it's a lot easier, and Pablo can, can weigh in here, but it's a lot easier to be like, okay, I'm gonna deal with these two functions that got removed in this minor update as opposed to waiting and suddenly you're a couple versions behind and there's 
20 different things that changed and you have to mentally model all of that all the impact of the changes and work your way through that to get all your unit tests and end-to-end -end tests and everything else running again which is frustrating and everyone knows that you have so many meetings in your day and everything else so uh, you can't avoid the breaking changes on the other hand if you're doing it regularly, they're going to be smaller. And also there's tons of tools out there nowadays, like Copilot just introduced something, uh, GitLab just introduced something that I can't recall the name of, but everyone's trying to kind of give you some helpful hints when you're doing your coding. So that should even improve your efficiency for like, all right, I'm going to schedule, you know, every Monday, first Monday of the month, I'm just going to knock this stuff out. So it sucks. But if you're keeping up with it, it's like, keeping up with your house when you're cleaning. If you're keeping up with it, it's not going to be terrible. If you ignore it for months at a time, it's going to be yeah. pretty bad. You always have this exponential uh, line that we showed earlier. The more you wait, the more that will be expensive to actually fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I understand that Active State has a tool as well that can help you with this. So if you want to go into that a little bit. Yeah. Do we have our little robot? Let's see. Da, da, da. I'm not sure where our little robot went. He might be further, he might be further along. Oh no, but, I'm sorry. I'm jumping no, the line. <laughs> that's okay. We can, we can jump ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what we're doing is like we said, AI is an awesome tool for acceleration, but anybody who's worked with AI knows that it can hallucinate knows that it potentially is going to not write something securely because it's modeling it off a lot of existing code. And what does a lot of existing code have bugs? Uh, so what we're doing is we will help you get current from, you know, a very older version and all that headache. If you don't want to do that, you know, multiple jumps, we're going to leverage AI plus all of our Python experts. So for those of you who know, we have been around for a long time and we have a lot of expertise in Python. And so we're going to have real humans reviewing the suggestions for AI for A, is this a good suggestion? B, like, can I do it better? Uh, and that will enable you to get up into the realm of current. You don't need to be bleeding edge. Some people don't want to be bleeding edge. And then the nice thing is from there, we're going to hope that you're leveraging, you know, the GitLab tool, the GitHub tool, whatever, as you're going. But we're going to check like on a monthly basis for you. Hey, are there some updates? Can we help you with those breaking changes? Can our AI and our experts go ahead and make that easier for you so it can drop that amount of, you know, headache that you've got? And so as those priorities, you're doing that trade off. Maybe you can reduce the amount of time that you're having to fuss with dealing with these breaking changes. So you're doing that maintenance. And as Pablo said, you're not waiting for the cost to get very expensive. Yeah. Cool. Uh, also, all that the more you wait and the more you try to rush things, the more you end up in the same situation where you you end up possibly introducing more more vulnerabilities and other issues that if you do have a, um, a normal pace of trying to fix things as you go, uh, you reduce that window and you also make people's life better. Whomever's working on that. Yeah, and as you can see here, like if you're jumping from 3.7 to 3.12, like everything's broken, you've got to fix so many functions, so many things. Whereas if you had jumped from 3.7 to 3.8, you would have only had that one tweak. Or, you know, if you waited a little bit longer, 3.7 to 3.10, all right, that sucks, but not quite as bad as jumping, you know, all the way up. Yeah, indeed. Um, thanks for shuffling around there a little bit. Um, so I also want to go back to the supply chain risk because this keeps popping up in you know every conversation and security is huge it's it is it's got to be a massive concern for everyone when we're talking about this so how does this how does this relate to addressing open source supply chain security risk and that was a mouthful so now i will let you talk all right <laughs> Um, so when we say 96% of code base contains open source, um, if you just look at Linux, you have everything's based on glibc. Um, so mm -hmm. every single binary will be dependent and will have some sort, some pos a vector of vulnerability if that ever gets modified or ever that ever gets tainted. 
Um, but that's the case for most open source software. And to, in today's world, uh, Windows is not exempt, neither is Mac OS, because they all rely on, on very similar libraries. Right. Um, and again, um, one compromise <laughs> means many breaches because your library is used by multiple products. Um, this can be a, a Git repository that got impacted. There's many, many places where this uh, where a, a hacker or um, concern, a bad actor can actually go and apply and, and try to get his, uh, uh, his payload uh, delivered. And this is, it's a huge problem. I think we, we've heard lately the, um, the biggest names, I think everyone's fed up of hearing those names, so I'm not gonna mention them, but everyone's heard of major companies that push uh, software into a security package and boom, there you go. That's uh, a bad story. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now there has been a few attempts from the industry, um, but I think right now what we see is uh, salsa, which is the one of the most predominant and the most promising uh, efforts, and the most complete, I would say, because you have uh, everything ranging from your 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 packages, where to build, the provenance, how they're built, also. Um, and that's all controlled tightly and there's a standard which will help you kind of reduce that risk because you you know your final packages has all these dependencies but you can trace back all the way to those smaller dependencies uh and like i was giving an example of glibc which everything in linux relies on that so uh it is it is a very significant effort and i think it's uh it is the way to go uh having better standards and for those of you who have not heard, uh, salsa is not the thing that you put on Tostito chips, mm -hmm. although that is delicious. And there is something called guac, which is not guacamole that goes on chips that pairs with it. Um, and they actually were, they're now part of the open source software foundation, the OSSF. And you can uh, join those meetings. They're recorded, they're on YouTube. And what it stands for is supply chain levels of software artifacts. And so that means there are levels, uh, one, two, three, there might eventually be four. And it's bringing a common understanding of, hey, to be secure, we want everyone to hit this bar for their source code or hit this bar for their build process. And if somebody says, oh, I'm level two or I'm level three, you now have a common language to understand, okay, I know what they're doing. And to add to Nicole's point, uh, this this is an open, uh, open standard. So like anything that's open source, you can look at it, you can see where it comes, how the code is being written. And in and, and the case of SALS, there, there's, uh, there's committees, there's people that agree that define what it is, what it is where we're trying to achieve and how we're delivering it. And it's not a, an, a closed uh, standard. So it is, even, I think, through transparency, you establish better trust. And uh, from what I understand, active state is at SALSA level three, correct? So, yes. Okay. Uh, and I go to as many of the Monday meetings uh, to participate as I possibly can. So we're trying to help craft it because conveniently when it first came out, we were stoked because everything they were recommending, we were already doing. Awesome. We are building in isolated ephemeral containers that are destroyed. Nobody can put in user variables into those containers. And so you're really Everything in life is about security and depth, whether it's, you know, you're on a dating app and you're deciding, you know, what to do about that, or if you're building software. Uh, so put those layers of protection in. And we were like, hey, we agree with everything that they're saying, you know, make sure that you are recording everything so that you can reproduce it later. Make sure you're not allowing just random user input. Make sure that you know where you got your source from, that you're building it, that you're seeing if it's trying to make any squirrely calls, et cetera, et cetera. So, we were very happy to join in on that one. Awesome. So let's go back and talk a little bit more about AI. So we touched on this a little bit, but let's dive a little deeper and talk about how AI can help address all of these challenges that we've been talking about so far. Don't know. I mean, you yeah, it's, it's uh, I can start with a couple and then Pablo can throw some in like there is so much awesome. cool language model stuff out there right now. Um, I 
I'm not going to discourage anyone from using it. These uh, large language models were trained on a lot of open source code. They looked at, you know, how people are coding day to day. And, you know, everyone wants to think that they're unique. We want to think we're special and unique. But in the end, when you're writing code, there's only so many if clauses, you know, that you can write. And so you've got these things that are helping you just autocomplete. Think of how often now in just our emails, we autocomplete the emails, you know, thanks to the AI assistance and how much easier that makes life. You can do that with your code. Um, and that's built into a lot of your major Git systems. Uh, even if you're not wanting to do that, there's some cool scanning tools. Like you used to have to get manual pen testers. I still think you should get manual pen testers, you know, a couple times a year. But you can actually have some AI security-based tools running against your web apps and things now, which can kind of mimic things that attackers would do based on being trained on, you know, the latest MITRE attacks and things. So it's it's really great to see those things out there to save people time. But like we said earlier, you know, they're making their best educated guess. They seem really smart. They seem like they're out of Star Trek, but they can make things up like in that lawsuit case where that one lawyer used it without checking the references and it just wholesale made up a case, a legal case to reference. These can wholesale make up a brand new dependency and you could spend a while looking on PyPy or something for this dependency and be like, why can't I find it? Well, the AI could have could have made it up. Right. Yeah. What's your take, Pablo? You having any fun with any of the AI tools? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I've seen some of the produced code. It's it's okay. Um, again, it relies on a, on on what's out there. So it's not necessarily uh, bulletproof. And, and I think you still need a, some sort of a human supervision to make sure that whatever is going into, into your uh, end product will, will be coherent and will match what you actually want. And it's actually readable because <laughs> let's be honest, uh, I've seen some AI produce code that is unreadable and it doesn't even work. So you have to have some use it it's it's a great tool but you have to use it smartly it's not a, a magical solution we're not there yet yeah so as far as tools go i know a lot of organizations are using things like dependabot to do kind of what you're talking about and right. that's not entirely effective is that what I'm getting? It is. It, it's a great tool. Um, that said, you you got to watch it. There is uh, you will get a lot of alerts. You will get some that are false, some that are that are that are missed. It's not a it's not a bulletproof. It, it's and again, it is a very loud tool. So you will get a lot of alerts. And the problem with that, you you end up at some point having this mental mute where you will stop seeing the alerts and, and you, you will miss the important alerts and you, you get, it boils down to the boil cry of schools. So you, you don't want to end up there. You, it's, it's a good tool, but it's not, it's not a perfect tool. Uh, it requires manual, manual interaction and manual oversight. Um, and then you have other free tools that do a great job along the same lines, but like free puppies, you gotta feed them. You're gonna take them for a walk. You gotta clean them up, and you know they, they might chew up on some stuff every once in a while. Um, you you gotta maintain them, and you I think you go back a bit to the same problem we had before, where you still gotta maintain your code. So it's a it's a it's a it's a there's no magical solution to this uh, to this problem. There, there's tools that might help you do better because they're more optimized, but they all have they all come with their their own set of uh, of uh, issues. Some might work better for you, but you you gotta have a you, you gotta evaluate things wisely. Yeah. As long as you know what you're getting into, I think it is it's fine. But yeah, it's all of those flaws. If you go in and you realize those flaws and you're ready to to handle them and work with them, you know, free tools out there are great. And I think echoing back to that. You know, comment we made earlier, Excel is better than nothing, but there are certainly things better than Excel. So if you got to start somewhere, start somewhere and then maybe work your way up from there. Yeah. 
I think the, the even the Excel gives the idea of at least the the um, discipline to try to keep what you have in your in your as yep. as uh, same thing with the tools that you you try to do something and and then you can evolve and see what works better for you. Yeah. Every organization is unique, so what works for someone might not work for someone else. Yep. But how? How can Active State help? We all right. Now we get to go to me because I am go to the good stuff. I'm excited. Okay. So uh, we talked about things like being able to to know what you have, right? That's observability. We will easily be able to tell you here is all of the you know Python, Perl, Ruby, Tickle, whatever that your developers are using without having to gate them, so they can grab everything from us. And then we can give a report to whatever compliance group you have saying here is what is in use in, you know, by your developers. So you don't have to like have a lengthy process getting, you know, them to go through an approval process or you don't have to have the wild west where they're just grabbing whatever they want. Uh, and then we kind of talked about you need to maintain your upgrades, right? Well, we have what we call unrestricted upgrades. We will help you get current and stay current by you know, avoiding dependency hell. We're going to say, hey, here's a suggested update. And instead of, you know, giving you tons of alerts like Dependabot or other tools, we're going to say we've curated this one big lump sum change. And that change has no dependency hell problems. The whole tree all the way up gives you a net better change with their CVEs, puts you in a good stable place. And we know it builds and it's ready for you to go ahead and grab and we'll automatically refactor your code for you so that you can take it. Yeah, you might not have a human like vet through and take a look, but we've already had our humans look. So hopefully we've taken care of all the, you know, boring stuff. And you just need to think about your business logic and your value that you bring, you know, as part of your proprietary code base. And then scalable consistency. Do you spend a lot of time mucking around with the the developer environments. We've got the portable developer environments and we can build for all of your different OSs. So you don't have to worry about like, okay, is it gonna work on you know the Macs, but not on the Windows? We can even do some weirder systems, uh, just ask us. And uh, we keep them forever, kind of like that banking system, you know, you heard about earlier, once you build it, we store it so that later if you need to reproduce that because you deployed something out into the field two years ago and suddenly someone's reporting a bug and you're like, oh man, do I need to rebuild that from scratch? It's like, okay, well, we got all your dependency stuff here. So you don't have to worry about finding that super old copy on PyPy or whatever, like already bundled up for you. Cool. And then uh, stay current and get current. This is kind of that whole tech tech conversation we were talking about is, you know, making that less painful. If you are one of the exceptions, we talked about one of the exceptions, other exceptions could be if you're in the medical field or industrial control systems, they a lot of times because of vendor lock-in and things are stuck. So if you're in that field, like we will help you get as current as you can in the constraints that you have and you know whatever those constraints are. But for everybody else, we're kind of nudge you. We want you to be a bit more current than that. <laughs> And uh, here we go. We're going to switch over to a demo. And then I think we've got a couple questions that we can answer. Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to show you our platform. And I took pictures because demo gods do not like live demos. So I took the <laughs> risk out of this. And all right, we've got our projects. What is a project, Nicole? Well, a project is where we have bundled all of your open source dependencies and the language together into a portable developer runtime. And so think of it kind of like a Git system where you can have like branches and different versions of it. And over here, I've got like a, you know, machine learning basics runtime. That's great. Let's go take a look at that. I've got, you know, a handful of vulnerabilities. That's not great. Uh, it's not the worst. I've seen worse. Uh, I can also grab an SBOM and I know it builds for both Mac and Windows. So that's handy if I've got other people running Windows on my team, I can pop this one to them. Otherwise, for me, I can go grab this Mac one. But I know that the compliance department wants to know what licenses are hiding in here. So let's go ahead and generate an SPDX SBOM. Boom, that was easy. Upload it into whatever system or email it to whomever and they can see exactly what licenses are kind of lurking in here to check for the scary GPL licenses and other things that they don't 
you know, want us to have. And I can be like, look, I know we're compliant. Here you go. All right, but I actually want some more packages in here, right? So we've gone to the configuration page and I decided I'm gonna add Django and requests. So easy enough, it's kind of a shopping cart experience. Everybody's familiar with that on the internet. When I hit finish and resolve dependencies similar to your get systems, you get to put some comments in so that you can know why on earth did I do this? Because um, you know, looking back later, I can't remember what I did last week. And here's where the fun Sasa stuff we were talking about earlier comes in. When I say save changes and start build, what's happening on the back end? Our CTO likes to call it CI for your open source, um, but we are taking the source code. So not the wheels, not the gems, but the source code, building it from scratch all the way down. And that is in a isolated ephemeral container. So that Sasa level three thing we were going on about. And then once we generate that for you, we store it as a copy that you can pick up again at any point in time. So you can roll forward, you can roll back, super handy. You can get your Sasa attestations with it. Cool. And no dependency hell because we solved that whole tree with the things that you picked. Uh, ideally, you pick auto, so you kind of let us have a little bit of wiggle room to pick that ideal thing. But you can also pin it to certain versions, you know, the standard greater than equal to. But all right, fine. I made the binaries, right? What good does that do me? I've got to deploy them. No problem. CLI tool. So we call it the state tool, and it's a CLI tool. And I can run this to deploy it into a server, into a container, onto my local dev machine. Uh, if I'm using my local dev machine, we also integrate into VS Code IDE. You know, if that's your, your platform of choice, no problem. All right. I'm deployed. That's great. I'm going to go have a coffee. Forget about it. I'm going to become part of that 80%. Never think about this project again, except I got an email. This email says, hey, that project you worked on last month, there's seven new package versions and we can fix four of the critical vulnerabilities. I didn't have to get harassed by security. I didn't have to go researching this. I just had this nice little email pop up and tell me. So let's go check it out on the platform. All right, upgrade available, same summary I saw. So if I didn't look at the email and I had just been coming in here, I get to see that too. But what exactly are those seven packages updated, right? You know, I wanna know. Well, we've got kind of a summary where it says, here's the critical stuff we took out. We upgraded you from 3.10 to 3.10.13 because patch versions are awesome, right? And you know, here's all of the net changes. Well, all right, this looks good to me. Nothing in here that I think anyone's gonna be fussed about. But again, am I gonna have some breaking changes? Well, I do, but we've made a pull request for you and that pull request takes care of them. You just need to review it and accept it. So once I review and accept that pull request, same thing as before. I get my built from source binary bits that I can deploy with my new build from GitHub and deploy that into my container, deploy it onto my system. And I am now pretty current. I don't need to worry about you know, keeping up with things or waiting for security to yell at me and be reactive. I've been a little bit more proactive. And yeah, there you go. So let me switch that on back. Very nice. Very nice. So I'm going to bring in this uh, really great audience question here. Um, and they are asking what some of the common challenges are that developers face when dealing with legacy code bases and how auto refactoring, which is what you're talking about, can, can address these challenges. All right, we could go on for 45 minutes. I'll, uh, I'll do one and then Pablo, you can do one and we can kind of keep going. Uh, if anybody cool. has any other questions though, you know, feel free to pop it in. Yeah. All right, so the first thing we're gonna run into is, you know, you're jumping, let's just say they're jumping to a new major version. A lot of times people take that opportunity to kind of rethink what has my open source project become? What do I wanna do? All right, well, I've made that major jump. I previously had committed to calling things in this way. 
that's out because either that's insecure, that's inefficient, there's better things now that we've seen in other libraries. So I've completely changed the way that you need to call your functions. There's new variables. There is, you know, so now you have to have two, three, four different variables. And so if you just updated your dependencies and ran your code, you suddenly get all these unit test failures, you suddenly get all these end-to-end -end test failures. But if there's uh, auto remediation, then we're actually gonna go through, we're gonna see, oh, you called these functions and these function changed. We'll put in that pull request for you and actually give you like all of the things. And then we'll put in a thing that says right here in the comments, you need to put this type of variable here based on the documentation. So just type in the little thing there and you're done. You didn't have to do the research. You didn't have to figure it out. So it's not like this is, again, like I said, it's not perfectly automagical because we don't know your business, but we've got you like most of the way there because we're like, we isolated exactly what needed to change, changed it in all your files, and then pointed out, hey, you need to put exactly this type of thing right here. Pablo, any other type of uh, breaking changes you want to talk about, or should I? plot on about other crazy things that people do. I think that's pretty good. Uh, I don't have anything to add on that one, so. I can talk about other weird technical debt things not related to open source. Um, what if you hard coded some stuff in a way that you called things in a vendor that isn't supported anymore? Does anybody use Stripe, PayPal, et cetera? You ever had their API change on you? And then suddenly, your calls to Stripe or PayPal aren't working, boom. Identifying, hey, you're using that and you've got to update because they have a new version of the API or a new way to call the API, or you have to send the currency symbol now, surprise, surprise. That's another kind of breaking change is like, it doesn't have to be an open source library. It could be you know, an API that you're calling and stuff goes weird. I think we had another question pop in. What is the best application of AI in software development? And what stages can it be best applied? Sh Sharon, are you muted? Or am I oh muted? my goodness, I was. <laughs> That somebody's got to do it That's every meeting. That's unfortunate. Uh, yeah, it was me this time. I apologize. I must have bumped something. Um, boy, best use of AI and software development. Maybe telling when you actually want to talk to. I know. To <laughs> can someone make that? Um, I mean, I don't do production code anymore, thank goodness. Um, but I can say that if you're trying to query things as a product manager from some kind of data structure, uh, or you wanna do like a simple automation of something, AI definitely gets you a lot of the way there with um, you know simple internal data science stuff and whatever, you can be a not great programmer and it'll get you 50% of the way there, 60% of the way there, so that you have enough. A lot of the coding problem is knowing what type of thing you need to do. So if it gets you most of the way there, you can usually stumble your way the rest of the way to figure out, okay, here's how I extract that information for report out of our database so I can see what's going on. Or here's how I can automate this little goofy thing that I want to happen once a week. Yeah. Um, I think that especially for software development, when you're coding, uh, I'd say it's really useful if you want to get an idea of how things would work. Uh, I wouldn't use that code in production because there, there's what I've seen is not production ready, but it gives you a pretty good idea. Okay, fine. I'm, I'm, um, this is what I'm trying to do. This is an example. It's, it's similar to this, so I'll shuffle a few things and I'll get my, my function or class or whatever. Uh, I'm trying to get out of my uh, my uh, my AI search. Um, think about it as a uh, a better way to search your traditional server fault uh, already existing code. Um, so it's a it's a great tool, but as long as the the 
the boundaries are f fully understood. Also, how many people have had to do uh, generating content for quality testing? Uh, how many times can you come up with a first name, last name? AI is absolutely amazing at giving you lists of things. So you can be like, hey, I need 200 first name, last names, some of which include foreign characters. Boom, you have a bunch of data for doing your quality test with. And it may come up with stuff that you may not have thought of. You may have forgot about the O'Neills of the world and the whole you know, single apostrophe thing. And it might include that in there. So it is really good at, at patterns or just generating things. So if you want, as part of your dev, to like write some testing, or if you want to convert things, like I want to take this XML and go to JSON or vice versa, it's actually really good at simplistic stuff like that. So, uh, you know, what things do you have that you're like, well, that's not difficult, but it's just annoying. A lot of that can definitely get offloaded to AI. All right. Another example, data masking. You, you, you want to have a subset of data that is very relevant to what you'll produce and, and use uh, and test, but you don't want to, you want to remove any PII data. It, it could, I think that's, that's another great application. That's a good one. That is a good one. Uh, another question that just came in, in your opinion, what's the best open source AI tool so far? Hmm. I, I think with AI, that, that's a, there is a lot of tools out there that are very specialized into very specific uh, area. So you cannot, there's, it's not a Swiss army knife type of tool. You, you have to pick what you're looking to do. What, what is your end result? So uh, again, there, there is, a, there's a multitude out there that are open source, but you, you, you gotta really look at what is your expected result? Also, um, a AI tool is only going to be as good, kind of to your point, as the data sets it's specializing in. So if you're going to do something in-house, uh, there are, I'm going to forget the, the location, but if you, uh, a while ago, I feel like Active State, we did a, a machine learning webinar on identifying cats versus dogs. <laughs> I don't think I'm making this up. I really think we did it. And in there, we talked about here's a place where you could go to pull a lot of open source data repositories to help train your model. And we said, go grab this freebie one that helps you identify different animals because it had trained on a whole bunch of different pet pictures. And so uh, to Pablo's point, figure out what is the use you're going to have for it because different models are gonna specialize on different types of output, whether it's graphical or text or other things, and then make sure you're getting the right data sets to bring in to train it for the type of function that you're gonna do. And that's really where all of this comes in is kind of like I was saying with us, like we're gonna do AI, but we're gonna have a person vet it. We're making sure that we're doing a code specific LLM and we're training it on code data, not you know, grabbing something that specializes in graphics because that's really not going to get us uh, good results. And uh, finally, I think we've got time for this last very important question before we turn it back over to Cody. But um, do you have a trial version or any way that folks can play around with Active State? Tell us about it. Yes. In fact, I will say if you maintain an open source project, you get our enterprise version for free. There's a form on the website. So if you're an open source maintainer, enterprise version for free for the life of your project, just email me. Um, otherwise, everybody can pop in and use our free trial. It is not a time limited trial. It is a number limited trial. So you cannot do tons and tons of projects and have tons and tons of users. You'll go over the cap. But if you just want to kick it around or use it for your personal dev project, sure, have it forever. Cool. There you go, folks. And that is there in the, uh, the current handout field. And uh, check those out. All right, Cody, I'm going to turn it back over to you. But before I do, Nicole and Pablo, thank you so much for hanging out and chatting about this with me. It's been you. Fun. Thank great. you for wrangling us. No wrangling necessary. All right, Cody, all you. 
All right. Thank you, Sharon. And I'll just echo that. Thank you, Nicole and Pablo. It's been such a blast listening to you over the last hour, and we really appreciate you bringing your expertise and your time to us today here on Tech Strong Learning. So thank you so much. To our attendees, a couple of final notes before I release you. Um, the session was recorded, and we will be sure to send you an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find it on the DevOps website. Just visit devops.com slash webinars. I'd like to thank everyone for their chats and questions today. Those have made you eligible for our $50 Amazon gift card giveaway. Um, but say maybe you, you weren't as active in our chat and, and questions today. That's fine. You can fill out our survey. It is pinned to the top of the chat as well as in the handouts. We would love to hear your feedback about our program today. So um, let us know there in that survey. I'd like to thank Active State for sponsoring our program today. And to everyone here in attendance, thank you so much for joining. We appreciate you spending your time here with us at Tech Strong Learning, and we hope to see you at a future learning experience. Have a great rest of your day, and you may now disconnect. Thanks again, team. Thanks.